Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us for this week's edition of Investing Like an Executive. We are here with Raymond, the Deputy Country Head of Spiro, Kenya. Raymond, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, pleasure having you here. So tell me a little bit about Spiro. So Spiro is the largest EV player in Africa, uh, which was set up um, in 2022 and it spans uh, in several countries. Um, this is in West Africa, um, where we had our humble beginnings at Togo and Benin, and then expanded to part of East Africa. This is Rwanda, and ultimately here in Kenya. And um, we've recently also expanded um, into Nigeria um, and Uganda. And we have um, our sights set onto several countries, both on the east and also on the west of um, Africa. Um, and that's why we call ourselves um, the largest EV in Africa, because we have this large footprint um, across both east and uh, the west side of uh, Africa. Awesome. And we're sitting in front of a lot of bikes here today that are ready to hit the roads here in Nairobi. Um, tell me, you know, because I've met with people from some of your competitors as well, I'm curious what makes Spiro special compared to, you know, some of the other EV uh, bodas that we're seeing on the road today? I think that's, that's, that's a good observation and I will start with you meeting the other competition. I think um, one of the things is you have seen um, the growth to which I have just explained to you um, in terms of having this footprint. Number two is the amount of vehicles in this time that we have been um, commercially active on the road, and not only in Kenya, but across Africa. Um, that makes it very special. Um, number three is our vehicles, um, whichever model that we actually offer to the market, is anchored on a very simple um, ideology, and the ideology is on affordability. And we have done our research and development not only on the bikes themselves, but to even understand the customer trait. Um, what the customer really wants is how affordable is it for me to own this bike as compared to other bikes. Number four is on the model to which we do go to the market in terms of our swapping model, how our batteries are being swapped. And you will find that the customer experience for you owning the Aspiro bike uh, while you visit a swap station is really good um, because the border border guy, as you rightfully mentioned, has a lot of time to stay on the road to make more money yeah. as compared to spending uh, more time stopping. Yeah, he doesn't have time for two, three hours to charge. Exactly, exactly. So encompassing all this has really made us accelerate uh, much more faster and to, and to have so many bikes on the road. Okay, and you touched on the affordability aspect. I think that's incredibly crucial. You know, typically with electric bikes, the upfront cost is a bit higher than, say, a Honda. Yes. So how is this more affordable over the lifetime of the bike? So, number one, if you look at the four fundamentals that I've told you, is we have not passed on the ownership of the battery. And it is based on... So you own the battery? We own the battery. Ah, okay. And it's based on very simple uh, fundamentals. Again, uh, one is we wanted to take off that headache mm -hmm. of um, a customer wanting to have a battery, which we know that after some time it continues to deplete. Uh, and still keep it with us so that we can have this inventory where we can manage these batteries. And we do know that it has several life, uh, life cycles. Uh, number two is in terms of safety. Um, we have pushed the safety um, agenda uh, through us owning 
um, these particular batteries. So the upfront cost, um, because the cost of the bike um, or the cost of the battery yeah. is almost equivalent to the cost of the bike. And oh, once so you cut it in half. We've cut it in half. Ah, okay. Uh, That's the secret. Exactly. <laughs> and also to, again, make it um, a, a much more mass market uh, kind of a vehicle because you'll find 92% of the vehicles or two-wheelers that are being sold in Kenya are for Boda Boda. Yes. So this is a very huge segment and you'll find that the barrier of entry, if you keep it too high, nobody will want to adapt. Yes. But if you make it slightly lower, many people are opting uh, for our bikes. Okay, and how many, how many of your bikes are on the roads here in Kenya today? Allow me to give you some good news because uh, we started commercially being active um, in September uh, last year, which is 2023. And to date, we have above 1,300 vehicles on road. And this is only from two cities. This is only in Mombasa and here in the capital city, Nairobi. Um, so having been commercially active for about a year. 1,300 1,300 plus. Wow. And growing by day. And this is a success to which we are humble. Uh, by it, but we do understand it's just the foundation for us to even go for more because the market has shown us and it has given us the indication that it can even grow uh, much more than the numbers to which I've just told you. Oh. And I'm sure you've seen over the past few years there's been a huge amount of not only innovation but just in speed going to market for various EV manufacturers. I mean, in 2020, I don't think I would have seen any on the road. Now, here in Nairobi, I see a lot of different ones out on the road. What do you think, you know, the future, the, the macroeconomic status of your industry, where it's headed in the future? Um, very good question. Um, number one, we're just getting started. And if you look at how the macro, the general uh, uh, behavior of the market is, and going by the numbers, is more and more people are becoming more and more enlightened about EVs. Yeah. And there's this thing of affordability mm -hmm. that people are coming to the realization that this is a fantastic vehicle for me to own yeah. because it is more affordable than my normal internal combustion engine mm -hmm. to live with it. So there's that period, everybody now is becoming more aware about them. And like in 2020, when there was very little or absolutely none mm -hmm. in terms of passing out the information. Number two is there's a lot of research and development that is being done, not only by other companies, but I will specific, specifically be jealous of Spiro because we have invested quite a lot in terms of our R&D. And R&D not only in terms of the bike models, but including how the customer behaves um, um, through several um, MPS surveys mm -hmm. that we actually keep in touch with exactly what the customer, because we have understood this customer is much more enlightened than the customer we had several um, years back. So how I look at the future is really, really bright. Uh, and that's the reason why we have invested in Kenya, Aspiro, in a world-class facility where we will be or are manufacturing bikes and battery because we've already seen where uh, the industry is hated. Okay. And I'm curious on the sales side, how do you sell these bikes here in Kenya? Again, good question. Uh, traditionally, uh, the two-wheeler has been flooded by asset finances. Yes. And there are several of them. Um, they have perfected uh, the art of going to the market um, by ensuring large volumes of uh, adoption 
or uptake. So what we did as Spiro is, number one, to do these tie-ups with these asset finances who were more than ready to partner back with us and have a discussion of pushing the agenda of affordability because we wanted to position ourselves um, as an alternative, as, as the best alternative against ICE, not only against uh, EVs, but against uh, the internal combustion engine. And key here was the daily repayment by the sector, which I had earlier alluded of the 92%. Um, people were pushing for more affordable daily rental payments mm -hmm. or daily installments as they get advanced from... Uh, as opposed to weekly or monthly. As, as opposed to weekly or monthly. So it was unbearable. Um, some were very high. Yeah. So as Spiro, we were able to get the affordability really down and more and more people could now afford getting onto the bracket of owning this bike having a business and earning above 35 to 40 percent as compared to a petrol bike. Okay, yeah. okay. So that is one. Number two, um, we are also talking to commercial banks because this space is quite, uh, it was quite scary for them, uh, if, if, if you allow me to use that word, um, because of the uncontrolled nature. But as we have seen during the latter stages of the years, the sector has become more regulated. Mm -hmm. So we are very working very, very closely with the leadership of the Boda Boda Association of Kenya and the various um, associations around each and every county where we are present or intend to actually set up business. And also, we are working also very closely with other publics, uh, government institutions, um, just to name but a few so that we can ensure that whatever sort of business we are out there doing, um, we are incorporating all the stakeholders together and they can actually assist and help us in terms of improving the penetration of um, our bikes. Okay, and have you found that stakeholders, you know, particularly the government and regulators are very keen on the idea of electric bikes? Yes. Uh, a good example is like NEMA, because we know how environmentally friendly um, the e-bikes yes. are. So um, I'm happy to actually let you know that uh, Spiro participates uh, in tree planting through our own staff. Um, so it's, it's an activity that we usually incorporate it um, because of how impactful to the environment is. Yeah. But we go over and beyond that in terms of businesses. Um, I'll pick an instance of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, they are really keen and we partner with them uh, very closely in terms of showcasing and in terms of partnerships um, around the cities to which we are present. Um, because this is important even to other businesses on the agenda to which we are trying to drive. Um, so not only uh, the government institutions, mm -hmm. and we are getting um, help from other government institutions, and these stakeholders are coming on the table to actually listen and help us drive both the environmental, the business, and the economics bit of the bike. Yeah, because you're manufacturing it yes. here yes. in Kenya. You're doing all of this work locally. You are hiring huge teams yes. locally, yes. you know, so the economic impact mm -hmm. of a business such as yours, and even just your industry generally, if focused on manufacturing locally, has a huge impact. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, I guess switching the conversation around a little bit, uh, I know one of the big concerns that a lot of people have about electric vehicles in general, not just bikes, is charging. Um, so what is Spiro doing to ensure that, one, there are at least enough swap stations, that it is convenient and easy for your riders, but also that there is functionality to where they can charge 
at home or on the go? What have you done to make sure that is a reality here in Kenya? So as Spiro, what we have set out is again um, to understand um, what our customers really, really need. And in terms of our four verticals, um, research is a key thing. So before we make any business decision, we are backed by data and intelligence that clearly suggest these are the right sweet spots for us to go and hit. A very data-driven company. Yes, very, very data-driven. So what we usually do is we have an elaborate team who is like an advanced party um, to go out there and conduct a proper research. Um, and in terms of the swapping solution is both in terms of geo-mapping, where exactly we will need um, these swap stations, or fast chargers, or home charging solutions. Why is this important? Because it can make us zero in to geofence easily. Um, the go-to market strategy that we are going to deploy and identify easily these sweet spots to which we want to hit. Then from there, we can now start building up um, towards a success of actually having these swap stations around. And if I go back to make any business sense, um, is because, um, as, as you have rightfully mentioned, we are a data-driven company. And for every investment, we will want um, a particular um, threshold to be met for it to be more profitable. Um, this is tied up with the bikes on road and the batteries that are within that particular area. So that we are also not only investing widely, but investing rightly. Um, so that um, when we go back to our books, it makes sense for us to actually have these investments. Okay, interesting. Now, I see behind us here, you have a lot of different colors, black, red, blue, mm -hmm. green, and yellow. Yeah. What's your favorite? <laughs> They're all my favorites. Ah. <laughs> They're my babies. <laughs> They are, they are all favorite. So, um, I like the yellow one. You like the yellow one? Um, <laughs> I'll sell for you the yellow one. So what we've done is we've, we've, we've understood each region, especially in Kenya, they have particular color preference. And that's how detailed we are. In, and that's how granular we've gone in terms of understanding. Like I'll give you an instance. In, in, at, down at the coast, they prefer the color that is right behind you, the green one, um, at the coast. Really? Uh, yes. yes. Um, and this blue. Um, here in Nairobi, um, the color that is really favorite for everybody is black. Uh, there's a city to which we are soon going. We've already started seeing and testing the colors, and most of them prefer the wine red, um, which is there. So um, as Spiro, we've gone all the way to that finer detail of understanding which color really appeals to you so that we do not only sell for you a bike. We even go ahead and uh, evoke those emotions that this is my color that I really want and you will really uh, take care of the bike. Okay, okay. And you just mentioned that you're planning to move into a new city soon. Are there any sneak peeks you can give us on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so the, our next stop is Eldoret. Oh, uh, really? Uh, yes. A brand new city. A brand new city. Um, <laughs> so um, um, they got their city status uh, some time back. Mm -hmm. And we want to uh, pioneer um, EVs around um, this new city in Kenya. And we have other cities lined up uh, along the way so that it can actually open up the space. Because initially, just to demystify uh, that you will only see electric two-wheelers or four-wheelers or three-wheelers around the capital. Um, we want to demystify that as, as, as a company, as Spiro, and to actually offer uh, this beautiful, beautiful vehicle um, to the people across the country. Uh, this is really important because not only will it um, help 
the environment, but also stretch um, the affordability to this industry okay. across all corners of the country. Okay. Yeah. And, and I should have asked this earlier, but when you're swapping the batteries, how much does that cost? So it's costing Kenya shillings 290. 290? Yes. Okay. And, and it can last you? It can last you about, um, so I, I want to explain this so yeah, that it's, it's, it's really clear. Um, these are permissible uh, numbers, but it depends with number one, the kind of load that you have at the back of your bike. Number two, it depends with your driving habits, how you are braking, how you are actually accelerating. Because I can tell you easily that the driving experience of how power picks from an electric bike yeah. to a normal bike is quite different. So most of the people from time to time take some little bit of uh, learning for them to understand yeah. that you just need a very gentle... Is the acceleration is, is fast. It's pretty, pretty fast. So your driving habit in, in total, but the bike can last you between anything between 75 to 80 kilometers. Oh, okay. And if you compare like for like mm -hmm. with uh, internal combustion engine or petrol, you might need to do about two liters of petrol to do the same amount of kilometers that you can do on a full charge of okay. our battery. Okay, and two liters of petrol nowadays is just below 400 shillings. Exactly. So you can take the 400 shillings against the 290. Um, and this, the guy with the, the Spiro bike is going to do it on one charge. You might do two liters. Yeah. Already, we are, the alarm bells of affordability are, 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 are knocking somewhere. Yeah. Well, if I can be honest with you, I've... I've, I, you, I ride a lot of bikes. I don't drive them myself, but you know, I, lo I love getting somewhere quickly. <laughs> I even have my own helmet I'll bring around. Um, but you know, I've noticed that on average, guys who have the electric bikes, and this is just my qualitative understanding, they tend to be jo more joyful, a little bit happier, and such, uh, whereas some of the guys with the petrol bikes are, you know, very much like every shilling counts, like yes. I'm barely gonna make anything today, I need to yes. hustle, hustle, yes. always wanting to renegotiate prices. I've never, I have not had that issue with an electric bike. Well, I think it's, and, 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 and I'm, I'm, I'm happy that it came from you. Um, I think it's the bit of one we all know how volatile the world prices of oil keep on going up and down. Yeah. And for the longest time, um, not only in Kenya, but across the world, uh, petrol pr prices keep going up. Uh, and it's, it's quite a scarce commodity. Yes. Um, so this person with a petrol bike is always on living by the second. Yeah. That if you lose that second, chances are you are going home on a negative count. Yeah, you, you follow the EPRA yes. on Twitter, you're yes. waiting for the fuel announcement yes. every time. Every, 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 every single time. But the electric uh, guy already is exempted from having so many moving parts uh, in his bike. So he has less worry in terms of servicing, he knows that, um, like for us, Spiro, we do a state of charge. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't necessarily need to pay for a full charge. You just pay for what you have actually consumed. Okay. Um, so you have less worry because you can plan your journey. Mm -hmm. Number three, I'm pretty sure you've sat behind our, our bike and the riding and customer experience mm -hmm. is extremely different in terms of the health I cannot overemphasize in terms of the health because of the jacking. Yeah. Uh, the normal uh, petrol bike, because of the engine, it will keep on jacking. And you know how uneven our roads are. So that already is taken care of with our bike. It's smooth, it's quiet, the guy is happy, 
yeah. he's earning more money. Uh, he can use the 35 to 40 percent savings to go and invest it somewhere or do other things. Uh, when you encompass all this, you'll have a happier person yeah. as compared to the guy using a petrol bike. Awesome, awesome. And even the, the aesthetics and uh, yeah. the bike really looks good. In fact, um, one, 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 one day I, I met with some of our riders and they said, don't call us riders, we are bikers. Uh, because uh, our bike is, can even be allowed um, into places where other petrol bikes are restricted. Like CBD, correct? Like CBD, our bikes are allowed um, around there. And other key installations, because they could actually see. Yesterday, I, um, I, I met uh, uh, with our marketing uh, specialist, and she was telling me that um, one of the guys actually was stopped by cops not only because he had done anything wrong, but because the cops were so fascinated about the bike, <laughs> they had to stop the rider. I would have been worried there for a minute. <laughs> no, 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 no. They actually stopped him and say, I have not seen this bike on the road. Um, and, and the cop actually, uh, we, we now have a lead and we are going to sell to that particular cop. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Now, another question for you here in Kenya. Whether it's a mutatu, a bike, people love to customize them, yes. make them their own. What can they do with your bikes? Are you using, you know, parts that may be more universally designed, or how can they how can they customize their bike to be their own? So we've already seen very crazy ideas. Um, Maybe you should run a contest. <laughs> Talk to your marketing team. I think that'd be my recommendation. Do a contest. Absolutely. So, what, what, we've, what we've seen is um, we've seen quite um, some good amount of crazy ideas uh, in terms of retrofitting and in terms of modification. Um, however, we are always um, a safety adhering company because we don't want to mess with either the aerodynamics of the bike or the safety bit. So there, there's some minimal um, modification that we have seen um, on the bikes, um, which is okay, because it's, it's an industry that if you also restrict them, um, some of these guys have very crazy ideas. Um, we have seen, but we usually advise uh, to strictly uh, maintain the safety aspect and also um, not to lose um, the high integrity in terms of um, our bike. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. But I could potentially paint it. I know, of course, you as the company, you know, I may have to cover up the logo, but, yes. you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've, seen, we've, we've actually seen very um, unofficially um, guys wanting to um, be having the best uh, um, aftermarket Spiro uh, out there. So I, I can comfortably tell you, uh, we are looking at um, those guys. Some of them are giving us ideas of even accessories. Um, yeah. some, some of the accessories that uh, we can include. Um, say say or, they or, want a bigger windscreen one day, yes. or say they want... We yeah. have seen uh, some even doing windscreens bigger than the ones that are actually on the presidential motorcade. Uh, so we've, we've actually seen crazy ideas. Um, some even have covered, some have put um, some, some little bit of an extra seat. Um, uh, so it, it's, it's, people are pushing the limit of how the bike looks like, but they do not want to lose the general aesthetics and how the bike looks like. They want it to be identified that this is a Spiro. It's, it's, it's not your normal bike. Okay, now we're coming toward the end of our talk today. I have two questions for you. They're a little bit more on the personal side, um, but that's what this series is about. It's about, you know, humanizing executives and such. So my first question for you, when you were first starting your career, what did you spend your first paycheck on? It's meant to be a hard question. It is. I'm really <laughs> trying to go back. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply religious, um, so the first thing I did was, um, of course, 
um, do the religious thing. Um, I, I, that came in um, really, really important. Um, I also went and spent it with my parents um, because they really invested on me um, in terms of who I've become today. Um, so those are the two things I can roughly remember uh, vividly. Uh, the other ones I, I, I can't remember. <laughs> Okay, yeah, with that question, we've gotten a whole host of answers from, you know, some people saying, hey, I did the normal young person thing and partied, to others saying, you know, particularly out of West Africa, a lot of people saying we, it's tradition to give the paycheck to our parents. Yes. You know, we've even had a former CS claim to spend his first paycheck on sausages. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it changes over time. Uh, but I appreciate the answer. And my last question for you today before we head our separate ways um, is around if you were 18 years old again, what advice would you give yourself? You got to do it now. Yeah. You have to start now. Mm -hmm. The best time you have is always on three letter words. Now. Not tomorrow. Not the day after tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Re, start now. Pray, build that relationship yes. now. If you're to study, study now. If you're to do research, do it now. Mm -hmm. Do not wait, because someone else is already 10 million steps. So start now. This is spectacular advice. You know, I, I tell my team something very similar. Uh, which is, if it takes you less than five minutes to do it, just do it now. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, Raymond, thank you so much for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much.